Would you like to impact billion lives? Our alumni have innovated, created, and successfully ran thousands of multi-billion dollar organizations. How can we steer a new world? I'm so excited to have Tom Kali, Chief Innovation Officer at Schmidt's Future on the Impact Fireside Chat Series with me today. Tom Khalil, he's Chief Innovation Officer at Schmidt Future, the organization doing really phenomenal work. Uh, please go and check their website, schmidtsfutures.com. Tom has served at, in the White House for two presidents, Obama and Clinton. He's an econ economist turned technologist, futurist, and innovator. So let's talk to him and really understand what is going on in the world and how we can change the world. Tom, welcome to our show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. So Tom, I really want to talk about uh, your career, you, your education. So you went and you did economics and then you got into White House. How that transition happened? Sure, yeah, so uh, the, one of my first jobs uh, after uh, graduate work in, in comparative political economy, how do, how do business and government interact in different industrial countries, uh, was working on a presidential campaign, 1988, uh, for a part of the campaign called the Issues Department. And it's responsible for uh, developing the, the platform of the candidate, uh, getting them ready to understand the different issues that, that, that they will have to discuss as they go to different parts of the country, managing uh, outside networks of advisors, getting the candidate ready for debate. Um, and so I learned a, a fair amount about public policy. And then uh, the job that I got after that was uh, working uh, for a firm that represented the Semiconductor Industry Association. Um, and I, I'm sure that many of your, uh, your listeners and people who are watching this have heard of uh, Moore's Law before. Uh, so I, I had the privilege of, of working for Gordon Moore, who is the wow. chair of the SIA Technology Committee. So this was at a time when the US and Japan were having very intense competition in, in semiconductors. And so there were debates about uh, US-Japan trade in semiconductors, um, Japanese industrial policy, um, but also just how we were gonna stay on this incredible Moore's Law curve of being able to double the number of transistors on an integrated circuit every 18 to 24 months. So yeah. questions about how we would you know, stay on this, maintain this incredible rate of technological progress and the need to invest in research and development in areas like advanced uh, lithography, for example. Then in 1992, uh, I went down to Little Rock, Arkansas, where uh, President uh, Clinton's Clinton, uh, campaign yeah. uh, was located and uh, wrote some of his position papers on the issues related to science and technology. Um, and uh, then, um, uh, President Clinton appointed uh, Bob Rubin, who had been the chairman of Goldman Sachs, to be uh, his head of the National Economic Council. Um, and in 1992, uh, President uh, Clinton said, we have a National Security Council that makes sure that uh, the president is, is focused on national security every day. Um, and we need a comparable organization to do the same thing for economic policy uh, because he said he wanted to focus like a laser beam on, on the economy. Um, and so I was very fortunate to uh, get a job uh, working for President Clinton on the National Economic Council and to help lead uh, a number of President Clinton's uh, initiatives in the on, on, on issues related to science, technology, and innovation. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's how I made the So it's just your curiosity, uh, in a way, Tom, that you are so curious about technology. You started studying about it. You got involved. You got engaged in several, uh, you know, 
different organizations, yeah. and that's led you to even advising our presidents on innovation and how the innovation can help grow the country and the world, actually. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the things that I learned how to do over time is that uh, scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs speak one language and uh, policymakers and members of Congress uh, speak another language. Um, and um, by understanding uh, those different communities, I was able to help uh, build bridges between those those two uh, communities. Um, so for example, a lot of times, uh, you know, a scientist or an engineer uh, will will say something that is totally incomprehensible to a politician. So I'll give you an example. So in the late 1990s, I started to interact with the nascent research community in the field of nanoscale science and engineering. Um, and as you know, if you make a, a material, a device, or a structure small enough, below 100 nanometers in size, not only is it very small, it starts to have novel and potentially useful properties. Sure. Um, so um, I asked the researchers, um, I said, well, if President Clinton decided to make this a priority and the country invested more money in, in this field, what are some things that might grow out of that research? And they said, well, we might be able to develop molecular electronics with a storage density of 10 to the 15 bits per cubic centimeter. We could develop materials that have a Young's modulus of uh, hundreds of gigapascals, and we might be able to develop nano-engineered MRI contrast agents. Wow. And so uh, I recognized that if I went and told the uh, policymakers that they would say, you know, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so what I what I turned what I did was to turn that into language that that was accessible to policymakers, and the uh, and the examples that we were providing were we could store the Library of Congress in a device the size of a sugar cube. Uh, we could detect cancerous tumors before they're visible to the human eye. And we could develop materials that were stronger than steel, but a fraction of the weight. So I was saying the same things as the scientists and engineers were, but just in a way that was accessible uh, to the uh, to to policymakers. Yeah, so, so that's one thing that really the business application of technology. So when you talk to them, you talk yeah. to them about the problem it is solving, not the not the solution. You're talking about the problems yeah. and address are solved. Yeah, yeah, and also. Um, you, you want to get, uh, I think it's important um, to strike a balance between, on, on the one hand, you want to get uh, politicians and policymakers excited about the promise of, of science and technology, but you also don't want to overpromise. Sure. Uh, you, you know, you don't want to say, um, you know, uh, like a year from now, we're going to have a cure for cancer or something like that. Of course. But on the other hand, you want to, to give people a sense for what have we gotten for our past investments, right? So, so for example, you know, the government began to invest in what eventually became the internet back in 1969. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about things that the government has invested in, uh, the internet, uh, electronic design automation, uh, GPS, uh, speech technology, machine learning. Um, Even the wireless communication, it, Tom, if you look at wireless it. Wireless communications, yeah. a guy on the moon. I mean, that is yeah. a, such a fundamental thing. And we did yeah. that in 1969. And yeah. we, we had mobile phone in late, earlier, sometime what, mid 80s? Yeah, yeah. So, so you, have to ha you have to tell two stories, it seems to me. What, one is, what have we gotten for the investment that we've made so far? Uh, number one. And number two, what might be possible um, if we continue to make those investments in research and development, but also create the environment uh, that is needed for private sector innovation? Because, you know, the government is making these foundational investments in long-term research, but ultimately it's entrepreneurs who take those insights and to turn it into 
uh, commercial products and services. So let's talk uh, about uh, you know fostering entrepreneurship. Even wrote a brilliant paper on policy entrepreneurship, and uh, you are were, you are really a champion that how you can bring entrepreneurship and then create a better world for not just for us globally. So would you mind sharing with us that what is really the crux about it and where you see it is today and where we can focus on in future? Yeah, so why don't I say a little bit about policy entrepreneurship um, uh, because that's sort of the entrepreneurship that I, I've been involved in. So, you know, traditional entrepreneurship is uh, maybe identifying an unmet need in the marketplace that no one is addressing. Um, uh, raising capital, creating a startup, uh, recruiting great employees, uh, and then hopefully, if you're successful, uh, you know, developing a, a, a product or service that people want to buy uh, and where you can be a financially successful firm. Um, policy entrepreneurship, which is what I've been involved in, is trying to answer the question, um, how is it that you can uh, be a champion for change uh, that requires uh, policy change in, in the same way that, um, that an entrepreneur is trying to address an unmet need in the marketplace. Um, and so how do you go from an idea to something happening in the world? And maybe the best thing I can do is to provide an example. Yeah, please. So, it's very um, complex for me to understand. Well, what did yeah. Mean? Yeah. So one of the things that I uh, will do uh, when I was working for President Obama is that when people would come to visit me, um, I would ask them questions. Um, and so one question I would ask people is, in the same way that President Kennedy said, let's put astronauts on the moon and have them safely return by the end of the decade. Um, and, and he, he made that challenge in the early 1960s yeah. to say, well, now it's uh, over 50 years later, what are the similarly ambitious goals that we should be striving to meet in the 21st century? And um, most people would just look at me and say, well, that's a really good question. Um, but every once in a while, I would get a good answer to that question. And a group of uh, interdisciplinary researchers in neuroscience and physical sciences and engineering uh, had a had a workshop, and at the end of this workshop, they began to see the kernel of an idea, and uh, they were trying to, uh, you know, the neuroscientists were trying to explain to the people in the physical sciences and engineering why we didn't have why we were so far from uh, having an explanation of how the brain encodes and processes information. Mm -hmm. So in molecular and cell biology. We have this idea of how information flows from DNA to RNA to proteins. Yeah. And although, you know, there's still lots that we don't know about uh, how that process works, we, we know a lot, right? We, we've learned a lot over time. And they were saying, you know, why don't we have something like that for, for neuroscience? And the neuroscientist said, well, we are limited by the tools that we currently have. We can either measure the activities of a very small number of neurons, um, or we can take a fuzzy picture of your entire brain using a technology like fMRI, but we can't do anything in the middle. We can't measure the real-time interaction of large-scale neural circuits. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we could do that, then that might give us some sense for what this neural code is that might, you know, analogous to the way that information flows from DNA to RNA to proteins. So the people who were there from the physical sciences and engineering said, well, what if we made a focused investment in tools that would enable us to do that? Yeah. And so at the conclusion of the workshop, they, they called me up and they said, we think we have an idea for you know, one of these moonshots that you're talking about, a really ambitious goal uh, that President Obama could set. And um, the uh, I, I knew that there were if the, if there were three people mm -hmm. uh, within the U.S. government who, if I convinced, and they all got behind this idea that it was highly likely uh, that the idea would move forward. 
and uh, those were the directors of the NIH, uh, the National Science Foundation, and, and DARPA, the Defense Advanced uh, Research Projects Agency. And to make a long story short, they all said yes. Uh, President Obama agreed to put it in his budget. He mentioned the initiative in his State of the Union address. Uh, and then in April of 2013, in the East Wing of the White House, mm -hmm. um, he gave an entire uh, policy address unveiling the BRAIN initiative. And Congress was so excited about the idea that both Democrats and Republicans agreed to do something that they almost never do, which was to provide 10 years of funding for the NIH component of the initiative. Usually they just they make this budgetary decisions one year at a time. Right. So you, you might have funding for one year, but you don't know what's gonna happen the next year. In this instance, they said, this is so important that we're going to commit upfront that we will provide funding for the next 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. So, um, so that's what I enjoyed doing is being exposed to a lot of ideas mm -hmm. in the same way that a venture capitalist, uh, you know, hears lots of pitches from uh, from entrepreneurs, yeah. uh, identifying some of those ideas that, that were aligned with the goals of President Clinton and President Obama, um, and then figuring out the coalition uh, that, uh, that we would need to build uh, in, in order to make this happen. Make this and in order to make this uh, concrete for people, um, the question I, I, I would pose the following thought experiment. Uh, when people would visit me in the White House. And the thought experiment was that you have a meeting with President Obama in the Oval Office, and he says, um, Sanjeev, if you give me a good idea um, and you explain to me why you're excited about that idea, then I will call anyone on the planet. Uh, it can be a conference call, so there can be more than one person on the line. Mm -hmm. um, if it's someone inside the government, like the you know the the head of the National Science Foundation, or the head of DARPA, or the head of NIH, or the the Secretary of Treasury, uh, uh, Treasury well, Secretary, I can direct them to do something because I'm their boss. Um, if it's someone uh, outside of government, uh, like um, the CEO of a university, or the president of a foundation, or a major you know, high tech CEO, then I can challenge them to do something. So all you have to do, Sanjeev, is to tell me not only what your idea is, but in order to make your idea happen, who would I call uh, and what would I ask them to do? Oh. So so there's Simple. several reasons for the there are several reasons for the thought experiment. One is that um, uh, psychologists have this concept called agency. Mm -hmm. um, and what it means in this context, uh, it, because I worked for Presidents Clinton and, and Obama, I had the ability to send them a decision memo uh, and have them check the box that says yes. So if that happens enough times, you, you begin to develop a sense that there are more things in the world that are potentially changeable because they're the result of human action or inaction as opposed to the laws of physics. So you're not trying to overturn the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, you are, you're, you're trying to get uh, uh, individuals and organizations to take some action in the pursuit of some goal. Don't you think so it's almost it was, like moonshot then? Then basically what yeah. you are looking for is a moonshot opportunities and maybe uh, partially you are giving seeding some ideas to them and then they are uh yeah. sharing some of their own thought processes yeah no I, I mean i'm trying to say i'm trying to ask people three questions with respect to something that they know about the first question is where are we today so so for example where are we as of 2020 mm -hmm. the second question is where do we want to be um and that might be over the short term like the next couple of years or the medium term the next five years or the longer term, you know, 10 years, uh, and how would we get there, right? So it's, it's one thing to say, um, for, I think everyone would say, gee, we should be better prepared for the next pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> there were all these ways in, in which 
our response to the pandemic was uh, uh, it failed, right? Uh, and so I think it's relatively easy to say uh, we should be better prepared for the next pandemic. I think the interesting question is what specifically would we need to do uh, in order to, in order to be better prepared? I think I have an um, answer for that, Tom. Let yeah. So it. so one way to think about policy is that it's a, it's an effort by policymakers to uh, number one identify problems and define and frame those problems, but then say what are we going to do about them? Right. Yeah. It's to create a coherent relationship between ends and means. That is, you have some goal that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and there's some course of action, there's some set of actions by particular individuals and organizations that you think will move us in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so that's what I've enjoyed the opportunity to do is to be exposed to a lot of ideas, um, to identify some that I think are particularly promising, and then to try to figure out what I can do uh, given the experiences that I've had and the relationships that I've developed to serve as force multipliers for those ideas. So what, what can I do to help make them happen? That's so cool. So, uh, you know, there is one statement from you is, uh, I'm still not able to comprehend. I would love to come back to the moonshot question. Sure. Later. Is yep. post penicillin world and hundred trillion dollar, uh, I'm still oh, not yes. able to, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, wrap yes. my mind around what really that sure. means. Yes. So what the, what it's that's referring to is that we have a growing number of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, so there's more and more bacteria uh, that are resistant to the existing antibiotics that we have, like penicillin. Right. And the UK government has estimated that if we don't do anything to solve this problem, uh, that uh, by the year 2050, the number of deaths from antibiotic resistant bacteria would go up from half a million deaths per year to 10 million deaths. Oh, wow. And the, the total cost to the global economy um, would be $100 trillion. Because not only do, would you die as a result of antibiotic resistant bacteria, but it would be very, very dangerous to go to the hospital because there are more and more surgeries that a, a doctor might, might, that you might say, well, I could do this surgery, but you might get this infection. And if you do get this infection, then we don't have the ability to treat it, right? So lots of people used to die uh, from infections, but once we had antibiotics like penicillin, the number of deaths from infections went way down. The problem is, is that we have a continuous arms race between the, uh, the bacteria that are trying to evolve so that they they will be resistant to the to the antibiotics. So we can't just say, well, we've got a bunch of antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so we've solved the problem. Um, it's sort of like cybersecurity, right? You know, you can improve your cyber defense, but then the the offense is going to get clever, right? Yeah. So here the opponent is Mother Nature. It's sure. using evolution uh, so that uh, so that bacteria that you that you used to be able to take care of uh, with an antibiotic like penicillin, they're resistant to that. So those antibiotics no longer work. And the problem is that from the point of view of the private sector, mm -hmm. it's not a very good business. Sure. sure. Um, so the reason it's not a good business is that um, um, we might want a company uh, to develop a new antibiotic and then not use it so that we have it available as a second or third line of defense. Well, how does a drug company make money? It's number of pills sold times price per pill. Yep. So if you're telling them develop this and don't use it, uh, then uh, what's the point, right? From their point of view. So it, it's one way to think about it is that, um, you know, when you, uh, if, if you own a building, um, uh, and uh, you, you want to put fire extinguishers in the building, even though you hope that you never have to use them. Sure. Right? 
but but it but if if you said well why should i put fire extinguishers in there it's been like five years and i haven't had to, to use them right that 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 makes sense right up to the point when you're when your uh, building burns down. So Tom, let's go a little deeper in this question. Uh, when we talk about healthcare and when we talk about the way we are treating patients and people for so long. So if we go back a thousand years, uh, our healthcare and the way we are treating patients has evolved dramatically. However, yeah. if I look back uh, last 50 years, I see the speed of uh, innovation hasn't uh, is not keeping the pace with the diseases and the problems we are finding and encountering and maybe we are creating, including the pandemic we have. Yes. So, so extension to that is I'm hearing a lot about genome and CRISPR, right? Yeah. And I kind of really get, uh, and we have a lot of audience who doesn't even understand what it means, but if, since you are an expert and you are advising presidents and today even Smith's future, you are looking at healthcare as a very key area what is your take of that? And how do you see uh, things like that is going to change? Because I personally feel we are still taking pills. We are still taking uh, these injectables. Is there anything else coming? Is there anything else we need to talk about? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, healthcare is a very big and complicated area. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's roughly 18% of the, uh, of the U.S. economy. Wow. Uh, so, so, yeah, so it's, so I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, there's like one thing that I, that I can say about the, uh, something that is like, uh, almost a fifth of the U S economy, but let me, let me tell you, uh, first of all, I, about what are some of the most exciting, uh, areas of progress that we've made, um, in the, since 1800. Uh, and uh, why we still have so much left to do. Uh, and I think there's a single, single statistic that captures that, and it is uh, under five child mortality. Okay. So, so today, if you ask the question, how many children under the age of five uh, die every year? It's five million, right? So you could say, oh my God, that is horrible. And it is, right? It's 5 million children oh gosh, under the age of five die every year. But if you, if you had the same rate of uh, under five child mortality that you did in 1800, you know what that 5 million number would be? No. It would be 50 million. Wow. Right? So okay, we've lowered- To 10%. We, we've, we've lowered it by an order of magnitude over the last two decades. Um, and so it's been vaccines and, you know, the ability to treat infections like we were talking about. It's public health measures uh, like safe drinking water. It's sanitation. So a lot of it has been public health, not necessarily, you know, really, really, you know, complicated advances. Now, if the entire world were like Sweden, do you know what that 5 million number would be? Zero? It would be 500,000, right? So we, we, if the in, entire country, if the entire world had this, the level of under five child mortality that Sweden did, we right. could improve things by another order of magnitude. Wow. So, so there's sort of three things that you have to keep in mind at the same time. One is things are terrible. Five million kids under the age of five are dying every year. They've gotten a lot better. That number would not be 5 million. It would be 50 million if we had the same health system and public health system that we, that we had in 1800. And things could get a lot better if, the, if we could get the entire world to have the same quality of, of healthcare system as Sweden. We could improve things by another order of magnitude. Um, so that, that's sort of like an overview. I want to talk about a couple of things that uh, I'm particularly excited about. And one is this idea that we could, um, um, that we could make a direct attack on aging um, as opposed to the individual diseases associated with aging. So the, the way that we think about 
diseases associated with aging, like cancer, like Alzheimer's, uh, like diabetes, like frailty, like osteoarthritis, like macular degen degeneration, is that these are all separate diseases. Um, and for each of those diseases, we have to understand the, you know, the mechanism of disease. How does someone get this disease? Mm -hmm. um, and whether we can come up with a better way of to diagnose, treat, cure, and prevent that disease. But there are a lot of researchers who are in this field called geroscience who have said that there may be underlying mechanisms associated with aging that are responsible for increased risk of multiple chronic diseases. Yeah. Um, and so we have uh, this basic research in a field called geroscience, which is basically the biology of aging. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have more and more information about what are some of these mechanisms. So an example is something called cellular senescence. Um, so uh, at, as you get older, more of your cells become senescent, which means that they are zombie cells. Uh, they don't die, um, but they also stop reproducing. And they then start excreting molecules that are inflammatory in nature. And, and we think that those you know, trigger a number of biological pathways uh, that are harmful. And so- yeah, Our body can't flush those, right? Yeah, yeah. And so there are a number of researchers who said, well, as we understand these different uh, mechanisms mm -hmm. um, to have to do with things like epigenetic uh, noise and, um, uh, and telomere shortening and cellular senescence, uh, can we develop interventions uh, that uh, directly attack the underlying factors that are associated with aging. Um, and could that lead to an increase in health span? Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important to distinguish between health span and lifespan, right? So lifespan would be, let's say uh, like you had, you live for another five years, but during those last five years, you have major uh, physical and cognitive decline and you're no longer able to take care of yourself. Uh, you have to live in a nursing home and very few of sort of normal daily activities are you capable of doing. But that doesn't sound all that great, right? No. So I know some ideally, close family. Yeah. 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 So ideally we'd have a situation where you are independent, you have a high quality of life, you're, you know, walking around, you're still mentally sharp um, for as long as possible. Uh, and you don't have this sustained period of physical and, and cognitive decline. Um, and so I think that the uh, government should be investing not just in individual diseases associated with aging, uh, but interventions that are, that are meant to directly increase our health span mm -hmm. so that we have higher quality of life um, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, that that we're not uh, that we don't become a burden on on society because we have more and more people who have to live in a nursing home or assisted living or, or something like that. So well, that's an idea that I'm very excited. And then about. the productive the productivity of this whole society increases because sure. now these because these are very very intelligent people and they have so many years yeah. of experience. It's just because they're dealing yeah. with one problem, they are not yeah. fully uh, available for the, our future and to create that future for us. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, wh why do we have a retirement system which assumes that you're gonna retire at 65? Yeah. Uh, well, it's because uh, Bismarck, who was, you know, running Germany in the, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, discovered that that's when the average person died, right? So if you're gonna come up with a pension system uh, it wouldn't be a very expensive pension system if the age that you picked uh, was the uh, was the average life life expectancy, right? Um, Absolutely. So the, it's uh, it's it's reflective of what life expectancy was 
in happened. 19th century Germany, right? In the 21st century, um, if, if we're able not only to have people live longer, but have a longer health span, yeah. um, then people can continue to be making contributions to our economy and our society for a longer period of time. Yeah. No, I. So um, I don't know about you, but when I, I don't want to retire when I'm 65 and, no. you know, uh, play poker or or shuffleboard or something like that. I, I want myself with both both yeah. guns. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tom, I'm you know uh, it's it's really fascinating, and uh, I last two years I I'm physically more active, and I'm loving mm -hmm. it, and I see a lot of people when I go for a hike. I mean, I have seen people 80, 85 years old, and they are, yep. they are beating 24, 25 year old kids. That's great. That's great. Unbelievable the kind of life mm -hmm. some people have chose to live. It's not just the yeah. genes. I talked to them, and they they said that they are pretty regimented. Sure. They work really hard. It doesn't happen magically. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, no. I, I mean, I mean, a, a lot of the uh, you know, sort of pre premature mor morbidity and mortality is due to people making uh, bad lifestyle choices with respect to diet, exercise, smoking, and, and alcohol. So coming back to the question of CRISPR, because that is one question is, uh, and genome, uh, is continues to bother me. Like we talk about gene mutation, we talk about developing these kind of technologies where once we understand it, we don't even need, and we need different ways of treating these kind of problems because pretty much when we talk about yeah. cell regeneration or uh, cleansing our body, there are millions of ways we can do it. What I am asking is, Tom, how far are we that we will have these microbe kinds of thing in our body instead of taking these pills and antibiotic and all? We go straight to yeah. the source and kill that because right now what we do it is we try to treat the symptoms or we try to kill sure. everything where the problem is like yeah. that tiny and we are trying to, oh, let's burn the whole uh, liver or let's change the liver. But the problem sure. is not the liver. The problem is that's a small thing. Since we can't yeah. treat it, uh, we are trying to create. So it's, it's where, how far are we from that? Yeah. So I think um, I, I, I see pretty um, rapid progress or uh, uh, over the next decade or so if what you're talking about it is a disease uh, where you can say it's that one gene yeah. that we have to fix. Um, and there certainly are diseases like that where you're like, okay, um, we just have to go in there and make a, a surgical, uh, you know, use CRISPR or, or something like that. Um, the issue is that there's a lot of the most important diseases. Mm -hmm. um, we really still don't know what causes them, right? So the, the reason that we have not, we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's is that people had some hypotheses. Um, so one hypothesis were these beta amyloid plaques. And so a lot of people, because those certainly occur, uh, but it's probably the case that those are symptoms rather than the ca underlying cause and so people came up with a lot of drugs that were informed by that hypothesis, the beta amyloid plaque, and, uh, and those have not worked. So drug companies have spent billions of dollars trying to develop uh, drugs, not to cure it, just to slow it down, yeah. um, and very little has worked. And that means that we don't fundamentally understand the disease. We don't understand what the 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 disease mechanism. We don't understand the disease progression. And um, at that point, you are shooting in the dark and those are very expensive bullets. Those are, you know, billion dollar bullets that, that you might be shooting. So, so but, but where we really fundamentally understand the nature of the disease, and it's just like this one gene is altered slightly, mm -hmm. then I think tools like CRISPR can play a significant role. But I think there are more conditions that are, are triggered by multiple genes and you know combinations of genes and the, the environment that you're in mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and those I think are going to be more complicated and you know like also uh, something like uh, you know diabetes 
we know that uh, for certainly for type two diabetes, that a lot of that would be reduced um, if people would, you know, eat less and exercise more. So, so uh, you know, of course, um, you know, we, we don't have to, What are you talking about? We, yeah, we 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 don't have to wait for some, um, you know, super advanced, you know, CRISPR technology uh, oh, to sorry. deal with some of these things. Um, and then we're also learning about like the social determinants of health, right? So in the US, we've had um, a actually a, a decline in, li in life expectancy. Uh, and when we look at that, a lot of that is attributable to what are called deaths of despair. Uh, so alcoholism, suicide, uh, drug abuse. Um, and so, those are not things that we can invent our way out of. Um, we, we, are, we have to ask. Uh, with that. Yeah. But Tom, uh, yeah. let's change the question a little bit from the medicine yeah. and cure to just diagnosis. And yeah. we had some interesting startups, got billions of dollars. I'm not going to name it. We all know about those companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I personally, believe and i may be completely off i'm not a researcher i'm not a scientist but mm -hmm. we are not treating uh, when we talk about saliva we are yeah. not really doing much with that and in covid time this become very apparent that that can be a very good and easy test so question i have for you is where are we with these testing and do you see any moonshot opportunities when it comes to diagnosis because I completely sure. agree with you. If I can find out what is really the problem, probably yeah. I can find a solution. Yeah. No, I think so. Um, so I think there's there's opportunities uh, to do something called multiplexing. That is to be screening for uh, you know multiple diseases at a time. Um, I think that there may be opportunities for early diagnosis as well, because obviously a lot of diseases are are easier to solve. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, um, the, 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 the companies have to be willing to engage in peer review, right? If they, awesome. if they, yeah. they have to be able to, they, they, they have to have, uh, you know, real credible research, uh, demonstrating the, the, the accuracy of, of these tests. So we, we don't have more episodes. Tom, like I'm, we did with I'm not disagreeing that today, where are yeah. we? I'm not saying that that's our yeah. approach. What I'm thinking in my mind is for like few hundred years, actually, blood tests sure. is not new. We are doing blood tests for a few sure. hundred years, at least, if not longer. So, mm -hmm. of course, the test has changed. The quality has changed. We are able to sure. understand it more. But I don't see that much research dollars going to saliva. I don't see a lot yeah. of companies are talking about it. I know the accuracy is the issue, the quality issue is the but you and me both know today, we are more connected than we used to. The amount of data yeah. we can amass today, with especially with this COVID uh, data set we have, I hope uh, people are doing something with that rather than just testing it for COVID. Hopefully yeah. they are doing more than just COVID. And that I believe, honestly, is a gold mine for the future of humanity. Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. And agree that with is you. the I point I wanted to bring up that when we talk yeah. about moonshot opportunities, moonshot yeah. opportunity, in my opinion, is not a well thought out opportunity. These are the opportunities you see and then you realize yeah. and then there is a market, right market, and then you go yeah. up. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. So you, uh, so what are the other moonshot opportunity areas you see when it comes to healthcare? Well, I think, you know, one, uh, so when I was working for uh, President Obama, the Ebola outbreak occurred. Yes. Um, and so we were able to get some additional funding for some very exciting DARPA programs mm -hmm. um, that were aimed at dramatically reducing the time to go from a new emerging infectious disease to being able to have a therapy uh, or a vaccine. And so this was the idea that you identify someone who has been exposed to a pathogen like Ebola mm -hmm. and has survived. Yeah. 
you you rapidly identify the uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can use um, you can then uh, directly encode for those antibodies. So you can create a gene right. that would program the muscle cells in your body to produce those antibodies. Wow. Um, and that the process, and that this would be a platform technology. So all you've, oh, so as opposed to every time you have a new disease, you have to start from scratch. You have to say, okay, we, we now have a platform for uh, producing gene encoded antibodies and using that either, either as a therapy or as a, a, a sort of temporary vaccine. Um, and so all we have to do is uh, find the, uh, the antibody and create, uh, you know, a, a gene that directly encodes for those antibodies. And so the, the reason that that's so important is that that can reduce the time between when you have a new disease outbreak and when you have something that works. So that, that's, a, that's an idea that, uh, that I'm really excited about is how do we reduce the time to go from bug to drug? Exactly. So, so where are we with that, Tom? Uh, I believe that initiative was started a uh, long time ago. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're definitely, I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing some advances in this area. We're seeing, you know, some, some developments of uh, monoclonal antibody-based uh, therapies that, that are based on identifying broadly neutralizing therapies. Um, I think there are still some technical challenges, and a big one is manufacturing. Uh, because if you have a disease outbreak like this, you want to be able to serve, you know, hundreds of millions or even billions of people. And right now, the uh, the manufacturing process is 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 uh, still takes too long, and it and it's too expensive. So I think there's some room to improve the. Yeah, we, um, don't, we need the, those manufacturing robots. Process. You put it inside, yes. just cleanse it, and then goes out and yes. use it again. <laughs> exactly. Hey, before we wrap up, there was one thing that I wanted to talk about on the education side, if, if you don't mind. No, I would love yeah. to. In fact, that's my next question, and I want to really talk about your experiential learning, too. So please. Yes. Yeah. So um, when I was at UC Berkeley, um, I started a, a program uh, called Big Ideas at Berkeley. And the premise of that program was that students have ideas of their own um, and they're very passionate about those ideas. Um, and if we provide them with a small amount of money, mm -hmm. um, you know, they can, uh, they can make progress on those. So there was a group of students who were interested in the problem of safe drinking water in the slums of Mumbai. Mm -hmm. um, there was another student who was interested in using geospatial information systems to reduce the prevalence of malaria in, in North India. Um, and um, uh, the, one of the students uh, who was going to uh, India to, to work on this said, oh, while I'm in India, I'm going to uh, go see the chairman of Infosys. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, that's never going to happen. I mean, that would be like me saying, well, while I'm in Seattle, I'm going to drop by and see Bill Gates. And sure enough, she came back and, and you know, he'd met with her and was really excited about her project. So what's very important about young people is they don't know what they can't do yet. Um, and so they, they do things that that, you know, if they were, uh, if they were older, they might say, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that. But they're, but they're, they're very precious stage where they don't know what they can't do yet. So the, the idea that I'm interested in, and, and uh, I, I'd be interested in, in whether this is something that the IIT alumni uh, would be interested in experimenting with, um, is um, what if students could major in a discipline, but minor in a problem. Very cool. So, so what, I, what I mean is that maybe they major in computer science or mechanical engineering or, or economics uh, uh, or you know, molecular biology, but then Whatever. they would say, all right, what is the problem 
uh, that I want to help address, whether it's in my own country or, you know, maybe a global uh, con uh, global problem, and what skills and experiences do I need to have so that I can make an important contribution to that problem? So that you would think about the problem. You know, we 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 talk a lot about how we want people who are T-shaped, and what we mean by that is that they have depth in one area, and but they have enough breadth to be able to participate in multidisciplinary teams or multifunctional teams. Sure. And what what I'm saying is, what if the top of the T was the problem, oh, yeah. right? It, whether it's safe drinking water or preventing the next pandemic or accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy or oh, further that. reductions. So wh what is, what's the coursework and what is the, uh, the service learning? What's the entrepreneurial activities? What's the co-curricular activities that they need to go along with you know, studying computer science or, or mechanical engineering or whatever so that by the time they leave, uh, they understand the sort of broader context of that problem. So I'll never forget um, when these engineering students went to Mumbai, uh, they thought that this was a technical problem, right? They, they thought what we have to do is we have to produce a water filter from locally available parts that will cost less than $10. So that's what their definition of the problem was. Mm -hmm. And they came back and they were like, we think the technology is about like 20% of the problem and 80%, the other 80% of the problem is stuff that our engineering professor doesn't teach us. Our engineering professor no, never told us about slum lords, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or like, like why the water system doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and so the, you know, if they can be more prepared to think about these problems at a, at a systems level and recognize that they have, what they're learning about may, may give them the ability to solve part of the problem, but they need to collaborate with other people who understand these other dimensions of it, then, um, you know, they will be in a better position to, to help solve uh, some of the most important challenges that we face in the, in the 21st century. Tom, I 200% agree with you, and I'm very passionate about education. I'm on the board of few nonprofits around education, including our organization called Pratham, if you have heard the name. Yes. And I 200% yes. agree with you that, uh, and that's the one uh, key aspect of our uh, conference too, where we are going to talk about it. So the big challenge I have is, uh, and that's where I'm inviting people like you to talk so we create awareness about what are we going to discuss in December, but this is not like a one day, this is a conversation we have to continue to have for the future. Mm -hmm. So several things, whether it is health or education or anything else in our life, we haven't changed much. We think we have progressed more. We think about creating this uh, new phone is the progress or innovation. That's just the tool set. It's great. Now yeah. our life is getting better. We have air conditioning, light and all, but we have to think of our world and we have to question everything. And that yes. is what I'm personally seeing that we have to really collaborate, not just at yeah. the level of education institution or not even curriculum. Exactly what you are saying is just to bolt onto that thought is we have to create a foundation layer where we have government institution, where we have education, we have enterprises and we have common Joe and average Joe. We all are there. And this foundational layer is so integrated and then we start building the next level of future because the way it is today, it is completely disconnected. Policymakers have no understanding of what's happening in enterprises. Sorry, no offense to that. I mean, yeah. they're brilliant, they have a lot of data, but the data is still. Mm -hmm. Our world yeah. has evolved in the last 20 years and this pandemic has completely changed our world. No matter what you yeah. need, and whenever we come out of it, it's not going to be seen. Our world, so what you are talking about it is, uh, I truly believe, and this is what we learn in IIT, it is all about systems thinking, how we can really create these foundational layers. So I will yeah. definitely love to know more about it. In fact, are you writing or publishing anything around this area? Yes, no, ab absolutely. And the program that I, I started uh, at uh, UC Berkeley is uh, st still going on and I'm sure they would be delighted to collaborate with the IITs on this 
sort of experiential learning. If you can connect me with them, I will love to even invite them on our directors panel where we are bringing 23 IITs directors and really talking about the future of education. However, uh, you know, we have a wider audience and this video is going to go to a lot of people. Uh, where can they find more information about your initiative and what you are doing? Sure, yes. Yeah. So they can, they can look at, uh, Schmidt, as you said, schmidtfutures.com to see some of the things that, that we're supporting. Schmidt Futures is a philanthropic organization uh, created by Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Um, and uh, there's information there about the programs that we're supporting in tech and society, uh, in uh, really investing in people. So we have a lot of fellowship programs and talent programs that are trying to find extraordinary individuals and help them do for more for others. Some of the programs that we're supporting in, in basic science and uh, shared prosperity. How do we create an economy where everyone uh, benefits and, and not, just the, uh, not just the most fortunate? That's impressive. And do you have any blog or you do Twitter or what you use more often where we can learn a little bit more about your initiative personally? Yeah, so you know, uh, uh, I pu the problem is I publish all over the place, uh, and so there's not one place where I've collected everything. So that it's a good admonition to me to get my writing more organized than than it currently is. Yeah. I've seen some of your work, Tom. It's really profound. Uh, once you have uh, some place where uh, our audience can come and check all your work Great. and what you are planning and what you are thinking, it'll be really huge. Please do share with me all uh, the interesting and exciting thing you are doing. And I love to know more about the moonshot opportunities. I do see there are tremendous opportunities in the healthcare space. And uh, we talked uh, earlier before our call, even in the uh, food space, even in the education space, but health is right. where you and me both know it is like, it needs major shift. We need a global system. Yes. When uh, we started having a conversation, we were talking about what is missing. And I believe the biggest thing missing is a trust. What I mean by yeah. trust is we have healthcare data in silos globally spread out. There is no centralized place. We have this data available. Once we have this data available, whether it's a DNA data, whether it's RNA data or it's mortality data, you know, we can do really some amazing work with that. So that's what I'm really passionate about it. If, there is any way IIT or our alums can collaborate with uh, Schmidt uh, Futures or any other organizations, that's phenomenal opportunity in the healthcare space I see. How do we bring this data? How do we bring the trust back? How do we create opportunities? And how do we provide this data access to people who need it so they can create next level of drugs or next level of uh, healthcare systems to anything? Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the conversation and the great questions. I, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings to the end of our segment. Uh, this is your host, Sanjeev Goyal, conference chair of IIT2020.org, Pan IIT USA's mega virtual event. And I invite all of you to this unique opportunity, an opportunity to join us and co-invent and co-define paradigms of our future. Please register at iit2020.org. Thank you very much, Tom. Once again, you are an amazing guy and I really enjoy talking to you. Please do share with us whatever you're working on and we love to be part of your journey too. Thank you. Will do. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.